Well, first of all, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here at the Luton Irish Forum. And when Nolette contacted me and asked me to come and give a talk, I immediately alighted upon this subject, Ireland 1912 to 1922. Uh, for a number of reasons. One, it's the period in Irish history that I love teaching the most. Um, secondly, we're about to embark upon a series of commemorations. In fact, we already have embarked uh, up in Northern Ireland. Uh, they commemorated the Ulster Covenant only a couple of months ago. And that's one of the things I want to talk about. The Ulster Covenant, did that kickstart, did that trigger a series of events which were going to follow through over the next 10 years um, the lockout in, um, in 1913, the Dublin lockout, the rising in 1916, conscription crisis in 1917-18, Sinn Féin winning the general election in 1918, the War of Independence, the establishment of Doyle Éireann, the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1921, partition in 1920, the Government of Ireland Act, civil war in 1922, a 10-year period a very, very short period of time. And we know that 10 years is a very short period of time because if we back project back from 2012, we can all remember what we were doing in 2002, can't we? It's a twinkling of an eye. And it was a twinkling of an eye then. But that twinkling of an eye established a series of events which have coloured the relationship between this country and Ireland ever since and of course, have coloured relationships between the two parts of Ireland, North and South, Protestant and Catholic. And that's what I want to concentrate on today. The reason I find this period so fascinating, there's two reasons. The first reason is, why was it the case that a very unsuccessful revolutionary organisation which ever since it was founded in the 1860s had enjoyed minimal support from the Irish people, from Irish nationalist people. I'm talking about the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Why is it that in only a couple of years that organisation was able to expel the, the best, biggest empire that the world had ever seen from the island of Ireland, or most of it, and not only that, but establish a government which then went on to become one of the most stable parliamentary democracies in the whole of 20th century Europe. I find that fascinating. The Irish people gave very, very little support to the Irish Republican Brotherhood for its first 40 years in uh, existence. It was singularly unsuccessful, but in a matter of years, in the period that we're talking about, it achieved independence from the greatest empire that the world has ever seen, and of course stimulated other parts of the British Empire, India in particular, into attempting the same 20 or 30 years later. Not only that, but from this revolutionary, got to be said, undemocratic background, a secret society, unaccountable to anybody except its own membership, there was established and born in blood and born in civil war an internecine strife, not a very prepossessing set of conditions for a parliamentary democracy uh, to uh, evolve from, particularly as we know what was happening in the rest of Europe in the 1920s and 30s. But from those unprepossessing beginnings, the Irish Free State and later on the Republic of Ireland became a model of parliamentary democracy in 20th century Europe to the extent that today, that today, the Republic of Ireland is the fourth longest surviving parliamentary democracy in Europe. Did you know that? No? It's well worth bearing in mind. It is an achievement after Sweden, Switzerland, and of course the United Kingdom, the Republic of Ireland is the longest surviving parliamentary democracy in Europe. And what I'm saying to you, this is why I find it, found it fascinating, from such an unprepossessing beginning, such an achievement uh, is arrived at. And the other thing I find fascinating and why I enjoy teaching this subject, um, why would it be the case 
that Irish nationalists at the beginning of the 20th century would want to reject the prosperity and benefits of the most prosperous empire the world had ever seen. When you think about it, it's fascinating, isn't it? Why would Irish people, Irish nationalists, want to reject the British Empire at its height? From a material point of view I'm talking about, from a financial point of view, and that's what I want to talk about uh, as well. Why that situation uh, was arrived at uh, as well. So what I intend to do over the next 40 minutes or so, what I intend to do is not to go through everything that happened between 1912 and 1922. We'd be here all night, okay? I intend to alight upon four or five, what I find interesting, fascinating topics, which ordinarily don't really, I believe, receive the attention that they should receive. And the first question, what was Ireland like in 1912? What was the political, social and economic state of Ireland before all this started? Before that decade, which I've just talked about, of revolution and change upon change started? What was Ireland like just before the First World War? What was the significance of the Ulster Covenant when Ulster Unionists indicated in no uncertain terms, both to their fellow Irishmen, nationalist Irishmen, and also to the British government, that under no circumstances would they accept home rule. Did, was this the trigger that started the process that leads to partition and independence less than 10 years later? Can we pinpoint why and when nationalist Ireland moved from supporting home rule, that is devolved government, inside the United Kingdom, a bit like Scotland is today. When did Irish nationalism and Irish nationalists, and why did they move from supporting a limited amount of uh, self-government to supporting Sinn Féin and its overt stance on independence? Next. What was the position of the British government while all this was going on? And in particular, what was the position, position of the British Conservative Party? This is an aspect of 1912 to 1922 in Ireland that is relatively ignored. But we need to look at it from the British state's point of view as well as Irish nationalist point of view. Because, of course, the interrelationship between the British government and in particular the British Conservative Party in the years before and after the First World War have coloured the relationship between Ireland and Britain up until the present day, a hundred years on. And finally, coming back to uh, one of the points I made right at the beginning, in fact, the first point I made right at the beginning, why did a state born in the blood and horror of, first of all, the Irish War of Independence, and then, even worse, a 12-month internecine civil war, why and how did it become a beacon of parliamentary democracy, an example to the rest of Europe throughout the 20th century? Now, my first question to you, and it's a rhetorical question, you can answer back if you want, but uh, what do you think was the most progressive and radical government in Ireland in the 20th century? It's a bit of a trick question, I have to warn you. The most radical and progressive government Sean in... Lamass. Sean Lamass. Sean That's usually what people say, Sean Lamass in the 1960s. Anybody else? Ah, I see where you're all coming from. <laughs> it is a bit of a trick question. <laughs> I would put it to you. <laughs> You need to go further back, further back. much further back, yeah. much further back. Huh? 1918, Sinn Féin won the uh, I can see that I'm not going to be very popular. Uh, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. I can see I'm not going to be very popular when I tell you that in my opinion... It's the British government, actually. Thank you. 
Thank you. Would you like to elaborate? Uh, hang, on, hang on, go on. You're on the right track. I wouldn't agree with you entirely, but you are certainly on the right track because I would put it to all of you that the most radical progressive government in Ireland in the 20th century was the liberal government, the British liberal government between 1906 and 1915. And I would give as my evidence for that the fact that it was this government that established for us in this country over a hundred years ago, the basis of what we enjoy today, the welfare state, the National Health Service. And remember, Ireland is an integral part of the United Kingdom at the time uh, that we're speaking. The Liberal government between 1906 and 1915 introduced old age pensions. The story is apocryphal that in Ireland, elderly people qualified for the old age pension if they could remember the great wind of 1839 because the records were so unreliable. It introduced into Ireland, as well as Britain, a basic system of national insurance which ultimately became our National Health Service. It wasn't introduced in its entirety into Ireland in the way that it was introduced into this country. It introduced a system of labour exchanges to create employment. And the point I'm making is that Ireland, as part of the United Kingdom, benefited from all of this because in 1909, 1910 and 1910, Lloyd George's uh, radical measures benefited all parts of the United Kingdom. And that comes back to the point I'm making right at the beginning. Why sh would it be the case that the majority of Irish people then reject this obvious material and financial and economic benefit uh, provided by this radical liberal uh, government. Why would Irish nationalists... Your question. Why did Ireland decide to, to go on its own? That's, 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 that's where we're going to end up. We're going to come to that. Yeah. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. We're going to come back to that. Yeah, just leave it a minute. We're going to come back to that. Well, now you're stuck. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's what I want to hear. We are going to get there. We are going to get there. Don't worry. Don't worry. But why would... I'm, I'm asking you the question. Why would Irish nationalists want to give up all of this? Why would they want to not be part, and I am going to answer it myself, <laughs> part of the most prosperous empire the world has ever seen? Why would they want it rejected? <laughs> okay, yeah. Why would they want to reject it in favour of, and I'm deliberately being provocative here in order to stimulate, which I can see I've been successful, <laughs> stimulate debate, why would they want to give up being part of the most prosperous empire the world has ever seen for poverty, unemployment and emigration as a remote, impoverished state off the northwest coast of Europe? Think about it. When I was back in Ireland during the summer, I watched, um, what's it called these days, T.G. Cahar, I think it is, Telefis na Gaelg, and they have a series of fascinating historical programmes. One of the programmes I watched uh, was about the work of the Congested Districts Board uh, in Donegal in the 1890s and early years of the 20th century. And it explained how the building of the London Derry and Loxwilly Railway all the way out from Derry over to Burton Port liberated so many people. And it gave us the classic example. And I thought, yeah, that's a very, very interesting example. Uh, the women in Creaselock in North Donegal who got very fed up about going to confession to the same priest every week. <laughs> and the priest really coming down hard on them for their uh, 
uh, alleged sins. And what did they do? They got on the train and they went down to Dunfanaghy and they went to a different priest and heard a different confession uh, and he heard that different confession and gave them a different uh, penance, a much lighter penance. Now to me that was a classic example of how British government investment, while Ireland was part of the United Kingdom, in the 1890s and early part of the 20th century, had liberated, in this case, so many women, you may think it's a pretty small example, pretty minor example, so many women in Donegal. I watched another programme there during the summer, and it was about the conditions that people living in, in a shark, I think it was, just off the coast of uh, Galway, uh, just behind Inish Boffin, had to suffer not during the lifetime of uh, Ireland inside the United Kingdom, but during the 20s and 30s. At the end of the 19th century, the Congested Districts Board had built harbours and piers and had tried to improve the fishing to provide employment so that people could stay uh, on in the shark. In the 20s and 30s, under an independent island, that investment wasn't possible. They petitioned De Valera, they petitioned De Valera's uh, opponents, but it was only in the 1950s that people were brought onto the mainland from Inishark. And I compared and contrasted the, the differences between the benefits, the material benefits, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, self-determination, or desire for freedom or anything like that. I'm talking about the material benefits that accrued to these people living in a very inhospitable part uh, of Galway, off the coast of Galway, under the British government, compared with the way that they were treated by an independent Irish government. And I gave you the example of the old age pensions earlier on. It's no coincidence that less than 15 years after Lloyd George introduced the old age pension uh, in 1908, the newly independent free state government in the mid-1920s had to cut the same old age pension because the resources weren't there, because the tax base wasn't there. And that's the point I'm making to you. We need to try and find out the reason, and I know you've all got various opinions as to why it was the case, why Irish nationalists rejected the material benefits of being part of the United Kingdom and the most prosperous uh, empire the world had ever seen, even though it cost them, even though it cost them materially and culturally. Did they uh, pay into the system, please? Well, they, they certainly did. Um, but, 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 but the point I'm making, the point I'm making is that um, they certainly were paying into the system, but in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, under an independent island, the standard of living went down. And the people who are in this room, my parents, are a classic example of that. And see, what I'm asking you to try and do is to try and think in terms of why it should be the case that something as ethereal and as intangible as national self-determination and a desire for nationhood and sovereignty overcame the material and the financial, because it's indisputable that the quality of life in terms of material terms did decline under an independent island. We'll all have an opportunity to say what we want to say <laughs> when I've finished. Now, let's look at Ireland in 1912. If you had told any Irish person, Protestant or Catholic, Unionist or Nationalist, North or South, that in 10 years time, in 10 years time, their country would be divided politically, that part of that country would be, to all intents and purposes, independent, a dominion inside the British Empire, while the other uh, part of the country, the six counties of Northern Ireland, would still be an integral part of the United Kingdom. They would have asked for the white men, <laughs> white men, for the men in white coats to come along and take you away. Nobody, nobody could have predicted what was going to happen in Ireland in 1912 over the next 10 years. All Irish men and women in 1910-1912 expected Ireland to be and to remain a unified country. Nationalists wanted 
some level of independence from Britain, ranging from some level like Home Rule to all the way through to the minority view that there should be complete independence uh, from uh, Britain. Unionists, both North and South, they wanted a united Ireland, but they wanted that united Ireland inside the United Kingdom. But nobody, and that was the reason why Edward Carson embarked upon his uh, political career. Carson is a Dublin Unionist who, be who, who believed, <laughs> Carson was a Dublin Unionist who believed that through exploiting the fears of Northern Unionists, he could, he hoped, keep the whole of Ireland inside the United Kingdom. When Northern Ireland was set up in 1920, 1921, Carson believed that his political career had failed. It had failed because he had failed to keep the whole of Ireland inside the United Kingdom. The point I'm making is that in 1912, all Irish people expected their country to remain a unified country. And if you look at um, the uh, Ulster Unionist opposition to Home Rule, the first Home Rule Bill of 1886, or the second Home Rule Bill of 1893, uh, you're struck when you look at pictures, photographs, of uh, Unionist rallies in Belfast, just how much they employed the imagery of Ireland, not the imagery of Unionist Ulster. They employed the same imagery as the Gaelic League, the Celtic Revival, was employing at the same time. The harps, the wolfhounds, the round towers. And that's one of the saddest things about partition in that Ulster Unionists, Ulster Protestants in particular, the vast majority of them, have, for one reason or another, forgotten their Irish heritage. But these Unionists, a hundred years ago, and at the end of the 19th century, when the home rule uh, demand started in earnest, saw themselves as Irish as well as being British. And that's one thing we also have to bear in mind as well. So all Unionists, North and South, wanted a united Ireland inside the United Kingdom. All Nationalists wanted a united Ireland, but with various degrees of independence uh, from uh, this country. But in 1912, the majority of Irish Nationalists wanted home rule precisely in order to benefit from the prosperity of the British Empire in exactly the same way as they had seen Scotland benefiting from uh, it being part of uh, the British Empire. And if you can understand that, you can understand why John Redmond, the leader of the Irish Home Rule Movement in 1914 on the outbreak of war, promised, guaranteed to the British government that the Irish volunteers would fight on behalf of Britain in the forthcoming First World War. Because that's where Redmond was coming from. That's where mainstream Irish nationalism was coming from. It wanted to be part of the empire, but it wanted its fair share, as it saw it, of the empire. It believed that Ireland was being discriminated uh, inside the empire. John Redmond, it's got to be said, was an Irish nationalist, was a home ruler, but he was also an imperialist, it's got to be said. He believed in the British Empire. Now in 1912, Ireland was one of the most prosperous countries in the whole of uh, Western Europe. Now we may think, well, how can that be, given that the tenements in Dublin were the worst in the whole of Western Europe, and that the landless labourers working in the west of Ireland, the people who hadn't benefited from the uh, British government's legislation, which passed control of the land onto the small farmers, landless labourers were extremely impoverished. The tenement dealers of Dublin were extremely uh, impoverished. But by and large, when you look at it, there was a substantially growing middle-class Catholic element, not only in Dublin, but also in the more prosperous rural areas. That's not even to mention Ulster, the economic powerhouse uh, of the empire at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century.
Social and political reform at the end of the 19th century, democratic political reform, had created an um, upwardly mobile, to use the modern phrase, aspiring Catholic middle class population, particularly in Dublin. And this was the backbone of the Home Rule movement. Well, the problem for the Home Rule movement is that it had been 40 years in gestation, ever since the 1880s, it was growing old. Its membership was growing old. Its MPs were growing old. And, more importantly, it had not achieved anything at all. Home rule had been defeated twice in the late 19th century. And now, in 1912, it was hoped that home rule would finally come through. Now, I mentioned the series of land reforms that had taken place in the late 19th century, again carried out by a British government, a Conservative government, in an attempt to, and I'm sure you've heard this phrase, kill home rule by kindness. The Conservative mentality was that if you could encourage the Conservative with a small c, small farming class in Ireland to see that their interests were primarily material and financial, that would in some way divert them away from political activity. And that's a very sort of conservative way of looking at things. It, you know, basically, you know, every man has his price, etc., etc. But as part and parcel of that policy, in the 1890s and the opening years of the 20th century, conservative government in this country had not only created the Congested Districts Board, which had improved the piers and harbours of Inishark and the other islands and the west coast of uh, Ireland. It had not only created the railways, which I was talking about, uh, which led to such uh, liberation, let's say, for people who uh, primarily before that had just lived their whole lives within their own local parish. But also it had reversed the land system, which ever since the 17th century had been dominated by what we call the Anglo-Irish Protestant ascendancy. So that at the beginning of the 20th century, Ireland was what it is today a land of small owner occupiers, small farmers. And the Tories believed that by doing this, they could make the small owner occupiers, the small farmers, become conservatives, become British. Or if not become British, at least be prepared to tolerate and acquiesce in British control of Ireland. So there was method in uh, their madness. The land confiscations of the 17th century had been largely reversed by the beginning of the 20th century. And in effect, when you think about it, the social and economic revolution in Ireland took place a good 20 years before the political revolution. The political revolution, which we're talking about in the period after the First World War, that is not what dealt with land reform. That's not what dealt with social and economic problems. It was an afterthought. The political revolution was an afterthought. It was, whether we like it or not, for their own reasons, their own selfish reasons, the British Conservative governments who actually forced through land reform in order to ensure, if at all possible, that uh, the Catholics, the Nationalists of Ireland, were kept on side. That's also the logic which was behind, for example, the 1898 Local Government Act. And through reforming legislation such as this, by the period that we're talking about, 1912, much of Ireland was run by the Catholic middle class. The Local Government Act actually ensured that the county councils and the cities of nationalist Ireland, primarily the South, we're not talking about the North here, were run by the Catholic middle class. Undeniably, that was the case. But despite these democratic reforms, and despite the expansion of the electorate, 700,000 uh, Irish people had the vote by 1912, local government in Ireland outside the North was run by the Catholic nationalists, there still remained a glass ceiling, a glass ceiling. Irish Catholics, this growingly 
confident, upwardly mobile, ambitious Catholic middle class could never hope to achieve ultimate political power because ultimate political power in Ireland was still exercised from Dublin Castle by the British government and their surrogates in Dublin Castle in the administration in Ireland, the Protestant Anglo-Irish ascendancy. And that is what alienated people like Redmond uh, as well. That's why Home Rule was so popular in 1912. Home Rule promised the rising Catholic middle class, both urban and rural, an opportunity to break through what we call today this glass ceiling and to run Ireland in their own image from the old Parliament buildings in College Green. And in order to do that, they would ensure that Ireland's membership of the empire played, paid dividends for this Catholic middle class. Now, it's got to be said, the Catholic population, large parts of the Catholic population, the nationalist population in Ireland, had done very well out of the empire towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. The, Ir the Catholic Church that we see in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, is an Irish Catholic Church that followed in the footsteps of uh, the soldiers and administrators uh, of the empire. Up to 40% of the British army were Irish throughout the 19th century. 30% of the administrators in the civil service in India were Irish Catholics, presumably nationalist. So Ireland had done well, or certain sections of the Irish Catholic middle class had done well out of the empire. But they wanted to go one step further. They wanted to ensure, and this is the essence of Redmond and Home Rule, that in fact Home Rule would deliver for this growingly confident Catholic middle class control over Ireland and the benefits of the empire run by themselves uh, in Dublin and that Ireland could benefit from the empire in the same way as they believed uh, Scotland had benefited from being in the empire. In 1912 everybody, unionist and nationalist, Catholic and Protestant, North and South, expected that home rule would come to pass. Why else would the Ulster Unionists have been so vehemently against it that they would threaten to organise their own private army, did organise their own private army, and import arms? Everybody expected that it was just a matter of time that Home Rule, uh, when Home Rule would come into uh, existence. The Irish Labour Party was founded in 1912, exactly 100 years ago. Why was it founded in 1912? So that the representatives of organised labour could take their seats in the Irish Home Rule Parliament. And so everybody expected that John Redmond would be the Prime Minister of Home Rule Ireland and sitting on the opposition benches, maybe the Unionists, probably unlikely, but certainly sitting on the opposition benches would be James Connolly and Porrick Pearce. These would be the opposition members of the Home Rule Parliament. Everybody expected that. Patrick Pearce actually spoke at Home Rule rallies in favour of Home Rule as late as 1912. You know, we forget these, we forget these issues. And I don't know if you're familiar um, with the great James Joyce story in Dublin as the dead. Are you? made into a brilliant film by John Huston about 20 years ago, right? Now that encapsulates, it's well worth seeing, it's certainly well worth reading as well, that encapsulates the standards, the mores, the aspirations of in particular the Dublin Catholic middle class that I've just been talking about. The Dead is set um, in January 1904, an epiphany party in uh, South, Ca uh, South Dublin in 1904. Catholic middle class. Gabriel, uh, the leading character in the story The Dead, he is berated by one of the guests of the party as being a West Briton. You know what that means, yeah? West Briton, Castle Catholic, all these sort of, you know, uh, phrases that we used to uh, castigate those Catholics who at least acquiesced in British control over Ireland. He is castigated for being a West Briton who wrote articles for the imperialist Daily Express newspaper. 
but the person who's doing the castigating is, and Joyce does this deliberately, is a flighty young woman. And he uses this device of a flighty young woman who supports the Irish language, the Gaelic League, James Connolly, the Labour movement, etc., etc. She's doing the castigating, and because she's on the periphery of silence uh, of, uh, of society in uh, 1912 or 1904 uh, Dublin, uh, very much so. <laughs> no vote. Young, female, impotent, marginal, eccentric. Joyce puts in her mouth the views, the sentiments of another Irish nationalism, but it's portrayed as being extreme. It's portrayed as being irrelevant. It's portrayed as being marginal. And Gabriel is regarded as being the mainstream of Irish nationalism, the typical supporter of Redmond and the Home Rule Party. It's a brilliant piece of... Uh, uh, literature and it really sums up the difference between the aspirational Dublin middle class which were the majority and the up-and-coming if you like young at this point marginal eccentric not to be trusted but their day was to come because that was an important another important point about the home rule movement it had been 40 years in gestation it hadn't achieved anything when Sinn Féin comes through in the period after the uh, 1916 rising, it's young and vibrant and dynamic and shows to an Irish nationalist community now completely uh, fed up, totally fed up with the Home Rule movement that there is another way to actually achieve Irish uh, nationalist uh, self-determination. But The Dead is a classic example of portrayal, the best portrayal in literature of this upwardly mobile, aspirational, some say complacent Dublin uh, middle class. So my question is, why was the incremental, moderate and tentative expression of how Ireland was to achieve its national ambitions rejected so fulsomely over the next decade. Were the Tories inevitably wrong? Was it impossible to kill Home Rule uh, by kindness? The Irish national ideals, sovereignty, self-determination, uh, always were going to transcend basic economic pragmatic uh, interest. And I think it all boils down to historical memory. Many historians believe that, yes, on the face of it, logically, there's no reason why uh, the uh, financial economic benefits of being part of the United Kingdom should be cast aside for something so ephemeral and irrational as uh, national self-determination. But when you think about it, historical memory is a powerful thing. And in the context of Irish nationalism, going back to at least the 17th century, land confiscation, religious intolerance, the memories of the rebellion, 1798, famine, etc., etc. Land is always an issue. And in the end, that's what wins through. And that's why the Irish Republican Brotherhood actually comes through in the end and is successful. The Ulster Covenant. I was over in Belfast there during the summer, late summer, and it went without uh, comment, I think, certainly over here, maybe more so down in the south, but very little about it in the south. The 100th anniversary of the Ulster Covenant was commemorated in Belfast, obviously amongst the Protestant Unionist community, community only. And it's so remarkable because the Ulster Covenant and what flowed from it the importation of arms, the establishment of private armies, basically established a template, the model, which was followed subsequently by the Irish volunteers and which was to result, as I said right at the beginning, in partition and independence less than 10 years later. Now, anybody who knew Ulster Protestants, and John Redmond should have un understood Ulster Protestants, his mother was an Ulster Protestant, uh, so he should have known it. They should have known that they would never buy into a political proposal, Home Rule, 
designed to promote, at their expense, uh, as they saw it, the social, economic, political and religious advantage of middle-class Catholic farmers and Dublin's Catholic, Catholic bourgeoisie. That's how the Ulster Unionists saw what Home Rule was all about. And as a result, 500,000 Ulster Protestants, equally men and women, 250,000 roughly each, signed a covenant in September 1912 designed to oppose, as they described it, the present conspiracy by any means possible to establish home rule in uh, Ireland. Now, you need to actually try and get inside the mindset of Ulster Protestants, where they were coming from, to understand why this was a fundamentally important development. The covenant, some commentator, when I was over there, I thought, yes, there's a certain element of truth to this. Commentator said, if ever you need an example of how Ulster Protestantism regarded its religion as being Old Testament and how Irish nationalism, Irish Catholicism, is basically New Testament, you look at the Ulster Covenant. One harks back the Ulster Covenant to the covenant not only between the Scottish Presbyterians and Charles I in the 1640s, which is where it came from, but right back to biblical times, the covenant that God made with, the Abra with Abraham and the Israelites, in which, if that covenant was broken, it was a bargain between rulers and ruled, and if it was broken, it absolved the aggrieved of responsibilities under the covenant. You compare that with 1916 and the proclamation. And the same commentator said that this was classic New Testament beliefs, where the 1916 rising refers to the redemptive power of the shedding of blood in exactly the way that the New Testament does. So the Ulster Covenant, the Ulster Protestants, Old Testament, biblical, 1916, republicanism, Irish republicanism, the redemptive power of the shedding uh, 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 of blood. The Ulster Covenant, I believe, is crucial. Not because, not because it gave an example to uh, the Irish Republican Brotherhood. They didn't need an example from Ulster Protestants that they should take up arms against Britain. But what it did was it actually, and its subsequent uh, events, the importation of arms, the establishment of the UVF in 1913, it reintroduces, after a 40-year gap in Irish history, the gun back into Irish politics. Carson was accused of reintroducing the gun into Irish politics, from which the Irish volunteers, Republicans, are supposedly uh, meant to have uh, learnt the lesson. Pierce. Pierce said himself, his famous quote, which I'm paraphrasing, that the orange man believes, he's ridiculous because he believes ridiculous things, and he goes around wearing bowler hats and sashes and marches on 12th of July. He's ridiculous. And Pierce said, yes, he is ridiculous from that point of view. And then he said, let me tell you this, though. An orange man with a gun is a far less ridiculous figure than a nationalist without a gun. And that's what I mean when I say that the covenant, the Ulster Covenant, and everything flowed from it, didn't actually give an excuse to the IRB to stage a rising against the British. Tom Clark, one of the signatories of the 1916 rising, an old IRB man, a Victorian dynamiter, a throwback to the Fenians of the late 19th century, People like him were in the ascendant of the IRB by 1910. They had got rid of all these people who wanted to sort of uh, flirt with politics. They were determined at some stage, when the time was right, to have a rebellion against the British. What I'm suggesting to you is that the time was made right by the actions of the Ulster Protestants through their signing of the Covenant, their establishment of the UVF, and the importation of arms because people learned by the dilatory British reaction 
to the UVF and their importation of arms, that the time was now right. It created a climate in which it now became easier for the Irish Republican Brotherhood uh, to uh, stage their rebellion against uh, the British. And if I could just go on and talk about, for example, when was it, do you think, that Irish nationalism moved from home rule, supporting home rule, to supporting Sinn Féin. Now we know, we're familiar with the fact that the majority of nationalist Ireland in the aftermath of the Easter Rising was against the Easter Rising. We hear all these stories about the uh, defeated insurgents being taken down to Dunleary uh, for internment over in Wales and being pelted with rotten fruit and tomatoes and all the rest of it. You know regarded as a stab in the back because there were so many Dublin uh, uh, families who were dependent upon their soldiers, their kinsmen, fighting in the British army over in northern France. We know that. Pre-war, sorry, pro-war euphoria was as rampant in Dublin, certainly in the opening years of the war, 1914 and 15, than it was in London and Belfast. German firms, anybody regarded as having German con connections, were attacked in Dublin in exactly the same way as they were in Belfast, Glasgow, uh, or here uh, in London. The enchantment with the First World War, though, starts to ameliorate, starts to be diluted even before the Easter Rising, particularly after Gallipoli, for example, in 1915, particularly after the impression seemed to be that Irish soldiers were being used as cannon fodder, far greater than soldiers from other parts of the United Kingdom. The Royal Dublin Fusiliers, after uh, Gallipoli, actually had to recruit most of their recruits from outside of Ireland, simply because so many were killed in the opening years of uh, the First World War. We know that the executions of the 1916 leaders started to turn the tide, but already there was disenchantment creeping in as regards Ireland's contribution to the war effort. I've mentioned Gallipoli. The military rule that was established in Dublin in particular after 1916 led to further disenchantment uh, with the British military presence and the British political presence. So what point, at what point, did nationalist Ireland desert Home Rule and move towards Sinn Féin? Now by late 1916, it became apparent to most Irish nationalists that basically Redmond and the Home Rulers had been sold a pup by the British government that there would never be home rule granted to uh, Redmond by any British government. That was the feeling by late 1916. But I would put it to you that that wasn't the factor that led ultimately to the transference of support from the home rulers to Sinn Féin. It was the conscription crisis of 1918. By 1918, Britain, the Allies, had lost so many troops in the mud bloodbath of northern France. There was a German spring offensive in early 1918. It seemed that Britain and the Allies were on the verge of defeat. Lloyd George's reaction was to seek to introduce conscription into that part of the United Kingdom, where, for obvious political reasons, conscription hadn't been tried before, Ireland. All those Irish men who wanted to fight for the British Army had by then enlisted in the British Army. There was a reluctance and a resentment to use, to allow young Irish men to act again as cannon fodder in 1917. 1918. And this led directly to what we'd call a pan-nationalist opposition. By that I mean Sinn Féin, the Catholic Church, and 
bringing up the rear, the Irish Parliamentary Party, the Home Rulers, against uh, conscription. The anti-conscription campaign gave Irish nationalism an opportunity to express its frustration and anger, particularly when Lloyd George tried to associate, to link the granting of home rule to the acceptance of conscription in Ireland. In the end, conscription did not take place. As we know, the German offensive was uh, thrown back and then six months later, uh, the Allies uh, won the war. But from the British point of view, they got the worst of both worlds. They didn't get the troops, but they lost Ireland uh, as a result, arguably, uh, of the conscription uh, crisis. It was Sinn Féin that benefited from the opposition to conscription, because in the general election, immediately after the end of the war in November 1918, Sinn Féin won the majority of Irish votes. And as we know, the rest is history. Sinn Féin reaped the benefits in the 1918 general election directly as a result of the uh, antipathy and anger towards conscription. Now, this did not mean, I would suggest to you, that Irish nationalists changed overnight from being home rulers uh, to being Republicans. But if the democratic process means anything, we have to accept that the decision made by Irish men, and some women now, in 1918, was to give support to Sinn Féin, not to the Home Rulers. But what did Sinn Féin stand for in 1918? Sinn Féin stated that if elected, it would withdraw from Westminster and establish its own parliament, Doyle Aaron, which it did. It did not state overtly that Sinn Féin was a Republican party, and that if you vote for Sinn Féin, we will set up an independent Irish Republic. They were careful not to say that. What they said was they would seek ratification of the Republic declared in 1916 at the new League of Nations, but then they would allow the Irish government, sorry, the Irish people, to determine what form of government they thought best suited the new situation post the First World War. That's not the same as being overtly Republican. And as de Valera himself said in the treaty negotiations a couple of years later, Sinn Féin is not a doctrinaire Republican party. De Valera said that, ironic, <laughs> given what happened and his role in the uh, subsequent civil war. Sinn Féin did not say to the Irish electorate in 1918 that if you vote for Sinn Féin, we will then embark upon a campaign of violence against British interests, British forces in Ireland. And the people who would come off worst out of that would be Catholic members of the Royal Irish Constabulary. They didn't say that. Because they knew that if they'd say that, they wouldn't have got the majority of the vote in 1918. And I put it to you that although we have to respect the decision of the Irish electorate in 1918, that mustn't be interpreted as the Irish electorate moving completely from home rule to republicanism. In the same way as I don't think anybody would argue the fact that Northern Irish nationalists, Northern Ireland Catholics, vote Sinn Féin now means that they are supportive of uh, all the tactics or the former tactics of the Republican movement. What is happening here is that they're seeking to maximise the impact of the nationalist vote in disputes with their political enemies. It's a gambit. It's to send the negotiators into the uh, conference chamber, so to speak, in order to uh, gain the maximum, which they realised could not be achieved under the discredited uh, Home Rule uh, Parliament. Now, I was going to talk about the role of the British government in all of this, but I'll finish on a positive note. Ireland as a successful parliamentary democracy.
these 10 years, it's a roller coaster. Violence or the threat of violence, culminating <coughs> in a bloody internecine civil war between former comrades. But out of this civil war, the new Irish Free State is the only state created in Europe after the First World War, after the Treaty of Versailles, that remains a democracy right through the 20th century. You've just got to think of all the states that were set up in Central and Eastern Europe at the same time and what happened to them. They either lurched to the extremes of the right or the extremes of the left. And as I said, Ireland is now the fourth longest surviving democracy in Europe. How did a small state born in such inauspicious circumstances survive as a parliamentary democracy? Particularly, as I've said, given that in the interwar years, its contemporaries on the continent lapsed into totalitarianism, the fascism, the communism. And I think the answer to this is twofold. One, it was lucky with its early politicians. And secondly, it actually adopted the British traditions of parliamentary democracy, which I think is very important. But if I could talk about its early politicians. Although after the death of Collins and Griffith in 1922, the new free state government, Cosgrave, O'Higgins, Mulcahy, were denigrated and derided as the Second Eleven. That's what they were called, the Second Eleven, because the great leaders, Collins in particular, had died prematurely. People like Cosgrave, who, remember, was one of the beneficiaries of the uh, local government reform in 1898. He served as a local Dublin councillor right through the period from even before the First World War. Kevin O'Higgins, Richard Mulcahy, they had strong democratic beliefs. O'Higgins founded an unarmed civil police force, one of the great achievements of the early Irish state. It was O'Higgins who, in a very, very memorable quote, said in a debate in the Oxford Union in 1924, he said, the free state government, this is a couple of years, you know, after the Civil War, he said, what were we? We were eight young men standing in the city hall, in Dublin this is, amidst the ruins of one administration and the foundations of another not yet built and the wild men screaming through the keyholes which I thought was a very, very evocative description of the reality and the difficulty that the new free state government had to cope with. But it was lucky in the people who were in charge. They're often criticised as being lacklustre, unambitious, conservative, short-sighted, particularly, you know, up against Collins. But the thing is, Collins died young. He's the lost leader. We don't know how Michael Collins would have developed, how he would have coped if he had survived through to the end of the Irish uh, Civil War. People like O'Higgins believe profoundly in the democratic parliamentary tradition. Even those with military experience, such as General Richard Mulcahy, who was responsible for the execution of Republicans in the Irish Civil War. He faced down an army mutiny in the Free State Army in 1924. And even De Valera, you know, he was always, apart from 1916, a political rather than a military uh, figure. And I ask you, what would it have been like, would it have been different if Collins and Griffith had lived? We don't know, it's all speculation. Collins though came from a profoundly anti-democratic tradition. The IRB, a secret revolutionary society, an unaccountable government inside the government. Inside the government. Collins had to refer the treaty, 
the draft treaty, not to Doyle Aaron, first of all, but to the military council of the IRB. Nobody had elected them. They weren't accountable uh, to anybody. It was Collins who ordered the killing of Sir Henry Wilson over here in London in May 1922 and a military assault on Northern Ireland as well in order to bring together theoretically the anti-treaty and pro-treaty wings of the IRA down in the south. Now these, were, these actions were after he had entered into an agreement with uh, the British government. Now we know that revolutionaries can become democrats, we've seen it ourselves, you know, in recent Irish history over the past 15 years or so. But the fact is, Collins died too young to find out if he would and could have developed into a Democrat in the way that the people who replaced him, O'Higgins, um, Cosgrave and uh, Griffith, obviously did. And it's fascinating. How would the relationship with Arthur Griffith have evolved if both Collins and Griffith had survived in 1922? Collins, the traditionalist Republican, the IRB man, Arthur Griffith, never a Republican. To Arthur Griffith, economic independence was the be-all and end-all of the struggle for Irish self-determination. He wasn't too worried about whether or not it was a republic, a dominion inside the British Empire, but it was the profound democratic instincts of men like Cosgrave and O'Higgins that enabled, in particular, the peaceful transition of power. And I think this is one of the greatest achievements of the early Irish state. How in 1932, we all know what was happening in Germany and Italy in 1932, but when de Valera and Fianna Foyle won the general election in 1932, they fully expected, also the apocryphal account state, to march into Doyle Aram. They had their guns in their pockets, expecting to be the victims of a free state army coup d'etat. That didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen is because the victors in the Civil War 10 years earlier were such profound democratic parliamentarians that they respected the decision of the people and power was handed over peacefully from the free staters to the Republicans who only 10 years earlier had been killing each other, literally. Now to me, that sums up the political maturity of the new Irish state and it's unreplicated anywhere else in Europe, particularly in the Europe of uh, the 1930s. And I don't know if like me, you watch the ceremony at Bill Nabla in uh, County Cork in August, uh, commemorating the death of Collins, the killing of Col Michael Collins in August 1922. And I'll finish on this note. I always find it fascinating that uh, democratic politicians steeped in the parliamentary tradition, like the modern um, rulers of Ireland, Ender Kenny, uh, John Bruton, people like that, they feel it's incumbent upon them to actually go along and pay reverence to the tradition of Michael Collins. When equally it's obvious, I would suggest, that they are light years removed politically from what Michael Collins stood for. And so I put it finally to you that in the persona of Ender Kenny, John Bruton and other politicians of their ilk, we see the ghosts of the home rulers coming through from a hundred years ago and arguably what has thrived and survived despite its apparent defeat in 1918 is the home rule tradition in Ireland and that Ireland, the modern Republic of Ireland, is in essence the home rule ambition realised a hundred years on. And if that's not uh, cause for debate and discussion and controversy, I don't know what is. And that's where I finish. Yes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.